Welcome to the Net Bible Church YouTube channel. If you haven't done so, please hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified of our new uploads. If you'd like more information about the Net Bible Church or how you could donate, please click on the link below. Thank you so much for watching. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, um, since uh, we have been posting, we've been posting our services on YouTube for for years now. You know, when we did, we took a, a break at one time, you know, just in how we do it and having to do it a different way and find another way of doing it. But um, in finding out that we have uh, many more listeners that aren't here, that don't even come to this church, that watch our videos on YouTube. And um, people that are hungry for the Word of God, that would listen to some, some uh, grandma preacher lady <laughs> that they don't even know, or maybe people do know who I am, and um, they're, they're watching the teaching, amen. So I, I do realize that there is an element. And some of them don't live in even California. They live in different parts. And I'm always surprised when somebody says, oh, I've, I watch your videos. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm always a little taken back. But um, you just have to realize that there's people that are hungering and thirsting after the things of God. And um, it's, it's not just about being at church, but that is a big part of it. Amen. We have to be at church. We have to be involved. Um, but something Brother Hagen said, he used to say, and um, I heard him say this many, many times, and um, I, I can't quote it exactly how he said it, but um, he had some visitations of the Lord and uh, the uh, great explanations and went into much detail explaining different scriptures and about the different um, the calls of God and and uh, just explaining the things of the spirit and the authority that we have in Christ Jesus amen because Jesus came that we would have life and that more abundantly and if you don't have any authority in your life you're not going to enjoy life so he gave us authority amen and so um but something that he had said, uh, that the Lord had said that the, the last move of God was going to happen in the local church, not outside the local church, but the move of God is going to happen in the local church. And it's not just going to happen in any local church, but it's going to happen in local churches where people are believing God for it. Amen. And um, they are in communication with God, knowing how to flow and move with the, with the Spirit of God. Amen? So we're forever learning. Amen? Forever learning. There's nobody on this uh, planet that knows it all. Remember Brother Hagen, <clears throat> he said he had read, read the Bible from cover to cover many, many, many times. And the Lord had said something about uh, a scripture to him one time. And he said, you know, God, I'd read that Bible from cover to cover, and I don't remember that. And he said, oh, son, there's a lot you don't know. <laughs> and so there's a lot that we don't know, but we're learners, right? We're not losers, we're learners. <laughs> Amen. So thank God. <clears throat> and, and how fitting that Jesus, the Son of God, the King of glory, the shepherd, the master shepherd of the sheep, would say that the last move of God was going to happen in the local church. And there's a reason for that, because God says in his word, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. That means there are times and places where you, that we need to assemble ourselves and come together. Amen? And so, <clears throat> and, and we have to understand that God is the God of 24, uh, tw 24-7. Amen. <laughs> he is the God of 24-7. I remember the first time I heard that 24-7. It's 24, 24 hours, seven days a week, right? And next week, 24 hours, seven days a week again. And God is the God of 24-7. And uh, he never sleeps nor slumbers. He knows everything. 
He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all, he is wisdom. Amen. Before the earth or the before the foundations of the earth, before the planets, before anything that's been created in this universe was, he was and still is, and he never changes. And so he's our God, and he's our Father, he's our Lord, and he's our Savior, and he's our best friend. He's our healer, our provider. He's everything that we could ever possibly ever, ever need. But it's a sad place to be when we hear all these things, and know that he is those, but they, we haven't made him ours. <laughs> Amen. You don't know Jesus as your healer until he heals you. Amen. So we have to know, we have to know God and all the beautiful, wonderful facets that he is to, um, to each and every one of us personally. It, it, you know, he's my personal Lord and Savior. You know, it's hard for me to imagine how how my best friend and how close and intimate we are with one another and, and the things that he shares with me and, and I've given in my life that that same Jesus could be that close with somebody else. But he wants to be intimate with everybody. He wants to be infused in every part of our lives 24-7. He doesn't want to be the God of Sunday church. He wants to be everything to us. Amen? Amen. So, so it's really up to the individual, right? We know that if people don't make Jesus their Lord and Savior, that they will, when they, they're spirits, we're all spirit beings, right? And we live in flesh, and all our flashes look, are totally different than one another, right? We're so individual, I mean, that's how we can, out of a million people, we could recognize each other because we're so different from one another. Amen? So, so in, in, in that case, we have to um, make a clarity because if you think about all the people that are not born again, they're not experiencing any of these wonderful things that we as the children of God get to experience. And then even as the children of God, there are some that don't experience anything of God or any of the goodness of God you know, just in a measure, they just know that when they die, they're going to heaven. And then sometimes they might question that. And then you have people that walk in the things of God and walk in the spirit. They live and talk you know, with God. And just like it said, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, like, you know, there are people that just disappeared because they walked so close with God. Amen. I don't think any of us are in danger of that. <laughs> We don't have to be so concerned that, oh, I don't want to get too close to God because I could disappear. Let me just say, they disappeared because they wanted to. <laughs> they just wanted to be with God. They didn't want to be with mankind and, and living around sin. And, and what we call sin, let me just say, what we call sin is, is, is so different than what God calls sin. Amen? And... Um, but God is not, uh, I was thinking about this, that uh, I feel like I'm a, a cheerleader. <laughs> I've been a cheerleader before. And you just stand there, and everybody's facing the team, right? The cheerleaders are facing the team. And occasionally, they'll turn around to the, to the uh, you know, to the, the fans, you know what I'm saying? And they'll like, you know, we go, first and ten. <laughs> first and ten, do it again. First and ten, do it again. Can or go Mustangs? Okay, <laughs> you know I was a cheerleader. So you know when when you're cheering, you turn around, you're watching the team. I mean, you're watching the team, right? You're watching them, and then the cheerleaders will turn around to the fans to give them a big cheerleading, right? Pep them up, <laughs> you know, a little song and a dance and something to get the fans all involved. Of course, you do have fans that don't need a cheerleader, right? Because, you know, they got their own cheering section. They're yelling and screaming and jumping up. Hold the bleachers. They're going to fall through them. <laughs> you, know? you know, you got all kind of people. You got all kind of people at some kind of sport spectating type of thing, right? You got people that are, you know, sitting on their phone looking at their phones. <laughs> I mean, you go to sporting events and people are actually watching the sporting event on their phone. <laughs> They're like, I'm confused. You're here live. Why are you watching your phone? And I guess because all the stats and I don't know, whatever. You know, and then you got people that are just there for the hot dogs. <laughs> you know, you got people coming. And it's so much like, like church. 
and um, you've got all kind of spectators. We're not supposed to be spectators, amen? But, you know, I, I was thinking about that, how I feel like I'm a cheerleader, and God is doing things and moving, and, and I'm getting revelation, understanding, and so he's wanting through me to give you, serve you the, the revelation and the understanding and, and those things that he shows me. <clears throat> Amen? And so, but I, I, you know, started thinking about it. You know, a lot of times people come to church as fans. You know, they're fans of God. I'm a fan of God. I am a fan of God. <laughs> I know it's friend, but, <laughs> you know, they come to church like, I am a fan of God. I am a fan of God. But so I looked it up. And a fan is an enthusiastic devotee, as of a sport or of a per performing arts, usually as a spectator, right? Spectator. <clears throat> do we, do we want to know what spec uh, the word spectator, that you're, you know, you ever hear the word spectacles? <laughs> it's an onlooker. They're just watching. That's what a fan is, a spectator. They're watching. They're looking. Amen? So sometimes people come as spectators. They're just sit there to watch. Amen? Or an ardent admirer or enthusiast as a celebrity or a pursuit. You know, they have, you know, all these big pop stars. They all call their fans. They got nicknames for their fans. I, there's some, some people some of these celebrities and what they call their fans. I wouldn't want to be a fan of them, but that's what I'm being called. But they, all these big pop stars like to call their fans something. And so <clears throat> they're just ardent, and <clears throat> ardent admirers or enthusiasts, right? And um, like you could be a fan of... of sci-fi or a fan of superheroes or a fan of Batman. <laughs> you could be a fan of uh, Henry Cavall. <laughs> you could be fans of these people. But I, I think that we have really got to have a clear understanding the difference between somebody that's a fan and somebody that's a worshiper. A worshiper, now let me just say, they use this word secularly that doesn't have anything to do with God. Because a worship, worshiping is a word <clears throat> that should solely belong to God, but a lot of people use it um, in their daily lives. They might worship their car. They might, you know, get a brand new boat and they worship their boat until it ends up at the bottom of the harbor. <laughs> they might, let me just say, and, and it says, the word worship is to honor or show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power. Or the word worshiper can mean to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. So sometimes, can you see the difference between a fan and a worshiper? There's a great difference between a fan and a worshiper, isn't there? Because... Let me just say, you could have fair weather friends and you can have fair weather fans. <laughs> we, being raised in Chicago, I didn't care if you like football, didn't like football, are you into football, everybody was a, a Bears fan. They didn't have to watch the games, but they celebrated in the winnings and um, everybody wore their navy and orange <laughs> on football games, you know. So, so, you know, we had, you know, in, because of our weather, we had many <laughs> different sports, and there's always some big baseball. We had the Sox and the Cubs. They still have the Sox and the Cubs. And then they have, you know, the Bulls, the Bears, <laughs> the, the Blackhawks. There's, there's sports teams, and they, uh, let me just say, Chicago fans are devoted. They're not just going to, they don't take on a team from another state or another city. <laughs> they're they're diehards. And um, so they're fans. So they are definite fans. And you can have fair weather fans. You know, I mean, 
you know, sometimes you don't, maybe like California doesn't even have a, a hockey team, so, you know, you're going to have to roll the dice for that one. <laughs> you know, you, and you could be for this team or that team and change from year to year depending on who's doing good and you don't like that coach or whatever. Those would be fair weather fans. They're just devoted, enthusiastically devoted for that season, <laughs> right? And so I was thinking about that with church and congregations and how everybody's different. And you have people that are just fans. They're just a fan of God, fair weather fan. And some are fans for life. But God's not looking for fans. God's looking for worshipers. And there's a huge difference between being a fan and a worshiper. A worshiper has reverence and awe. Amen. And respect and honor for God and the things of God, the word and the spirit, church. There's an honor and respect that you don't have for anything else in this life. Otherwise, you're not devoted to God. And, 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 the, and the thing about it is, it's not about what we as an individual want to do. It's about what does he want? What does he want? Amen? And so when you are a worship, a true worshiper of God, you don't go by your feelings. You go by what he says. You go by what, number one, he says in his word, and number one, what he speaks to your heart. And a lot of people don't know what God is speaking to their heart because they don't have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. God is looking for a few good men and women in this hour. He is looking for worshipers, people that are devoted to the things of God and to the kingdom of God. It's so dangerous for a Christian or somebody in the body of Christ to be a fan of God. It's so dangerous because there's an element of putting him first at certain times for certain reasons. Say, for instance, push comes a shove, they have a problem, they have a need. And they'll put, they'll put God first then because they know that they can't do anything about it and God's their only hope. And so when God comes through, then they don't need God, they put him back on the shelf again. It's so dangerous for a Christian to put God in the category as a fan. They're, they're just fan of Jesus. They're a fan of God. And now I'm speaking of, thinking about this as a stadium. And this is the bleachers. This is where all the, the fans are in church. And then we have God, and we're, we got our eyes fixed on Jesus. Our eyes on, and our hope is in him. Amen. We come to hear what he has to say to us. We come to hear from God. And I'm a cheerleader. <laughs> Amen? I'm watching the moves and I'm turning around. First and ten, do it again. <laughs> Amen? I am relaying to you the message of God for that particular hour. Amen? It's amazing how people will sit through a movie for three hours, but they won't sit in church for an hour. It's amazing how, how many people put God, let me just say, they're, God's, they're a fan of God, but He's way down the list. They got other things they're, they're got priorities of. And listen, there's a lot of message that messages that I that I, I that I preach and share and teach that I feel like, ooh, this is gonna be a tough one for people to swallow. And God's like, it's not your business what anybody swallows. It's your business to report what's going on in the field so people can make their own decision. Amen. Yeah. And the people that are worshipers. You don't have to cheer them on because they're already in, their hearts are in the game. You've been, everybody's been to sporting events where you have all kind of, you know, let me just say, I've, I've been to, you know, football games where, you know, you see young women and young men walking around, you're like, they're not here for the game, they're just here to see and be seen. 
as they call it, the way they're dressed and the way they're not, they don't know anything that's going on at the field. They don't, they don't even wear, I guess there's cheerleaders down there. I don't, they don't know nothing that's going on because they're just there to see and be seen. These are all the things that go on in church. People come to see and be seen. People come to ease their conscience. People come so those people won't criticize them. God is looking for worshipers. He's not looking for fans. Amen. Aren't you glad you're here to hear this today? Because it's going to make a big difference coming up in your future and my future, the future of this country and the world. If you find yourself, you find yourself in the wrong category, all you got to do is make an adjustment in your heart and, and make sure that you're a worshiper of God and not a fan. Amen. So anyway, I'm a cheerleader for Jesus and uh, church is the God show, right? It's the God show. And he shows up in every service looking for those that are hungry. He doesn't, he's, let me just say, God's not looking for souls. He's searching for hunger. Because every human being that you look at day in and day out is a soul with the potential of either going to heaven or hell for all eternity. Let me just say, if, and if you live to be 100 years old in this life, you've lived a long time, right? Because most people don't make it to 100. But if you live to be 100, you've made it a long time. But 100 years is absolutely nothing more than a breath compared to all eternity. And so where you spend eternity is of utmost importance. Amen? And when you get there, there will be a judgment. Amen? At the end, at the end of the millennial, there will be a judgment. We'll be in the, it'll be like a twinkling of an eye. We will all have to stand before God as individuals, and God is going to show our lives to us and everything that we did and everything that we said, and we'll be rewarded according to that. And we'll all know, and we'll all see those that gave their lives to God and those that just were fair weather fans. Amen? And we'll know and we'll see who the worshipers of God were. I don't, want, I don't want to get before God and see my life and regret it. Amen? I want to stand before him and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Is anybody with me on that? So we have to remember that God's not just looking for souls. Amen. He wants souls. Don't get me wrong. He who wins souls is wise. But he's searching for hunger. He's searching for hunger. If you ask any young mother, you get a... You have a six-month-old baby, a two-month-old baby, a one-year-old baby. That baby is going to get attended the most when they're hungry. That mother is looking for a time, naturally speaking, for a time to put that baby in the little chair, in the rocking chair. <laughs> in whatever they can put it in so they can get things done, <laughs> whether it's cleaning bottles, washing diapers, doing laundry, cleaning house, taking a shower, all the things that a young mother would have to do when she has a baby in the house. But everything stops when that baby gets hungry. Amen? Everything stops because that mama going to feed that baby to quiet that baby down. Amen? <clears throat> There's just something about a hung, a hungry, a hangry, a hungry Christian. Only worshipers can truly get hungry, and only hungry people can truly become worshipers. If you're a fan, you're not that hungry. You're not really that hungry. He is looking for a hungry heart to pour himself into. Amen. It's absolutely not right or legal for God to pour himself into somebody that is not hungry. He won't. 
he absolutely will not pour himself into somebody that is not hungry. Amen. His word is the bread of life. We've got to be hungry. Amen. I'm going to read a, a scripture, and like I do, read in three different translations <laughs> because they all have a little different flavor. We don't want just plain vanilla. We're going to add a little strawberries and some chocolate syrup to that today. Amen. And everybody said it. Mm-hmm. Amen. Matthew 5 and Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, and I'm going to start in the NIV, and then I'm going to read the New Living and the message. And it says in the NIV, blessed, blessed are those, blessed are those who hunger. It didn't say blessed are those that are complacent. It didn't say blessed are those that are too busy doing other things. It said blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Amen? They absolutely will be filled. God, let me just say, we don't have to figure this out. All we have to do is be hungry. All we have to do is be hungry. And he does the filling. Amen? If we want a more experience, a deeper experience, if we want a, a, a stronger touch, if we want... A, a, a greater blessing in our life, then all we have to do is be hungry. And if we aren't hungry, get hungry. And if you don't know how to get hungry, cry out to God and ask him, how can I get hungry? We got to stir up that hunger, not be satisfied with too many people. We got too much stuff in this world that people are satisfied with the things of this world and they don't have any more room for God. In the New Living Translation, it says, God blesses those, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. There's no satisfaction in this world, none, none. You can think you're happy. I, I mean, I, I grew up hearing people say, well, if I could just get, you know, I just need a new car, and when I can get that new car, then I'll be happy. You ever hear people talk like that? If I could just make this much money, then I'll be happy. If I could just, you know, if I could just fix my relationship with my ex, then I'll be happy. If I could just have a couple kids, then I'll be happy. People talk like this everywhere. If I could just have something else of the world, then I will be satisfied. <clears throat> and they get those things. And they're never satisfied because then it's like, okay, I have two kids. I want three kids. <clears throat> I got one car. I want a bigger car. I got a house. Now I want a bigger house. Amen? There's always something that we think will satisfy that you can never be satisfied from anything in this world. You can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> You can't. There's no satisfaction. Let me just tell you, if you think that you can be satisfied with something of this world, you are badly mistaken, and the word of God would call you a fool for thinking that you can be satisfied with things of this world. Amen? There is no satisfaction outside of God. Blessed is those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Those that are hungry and make yourself more hungry and get hungrier, make a bigger space for God to pour himself into. Amen? The things, God's not surprised by things that are going on in the church and the people of God. He knows people's hearts and what goes on in the hearts and who's just a fan and who's a fair weather fan and, and who's really a worshiper and who's hungry for the things of God. God knows all these things. Amen? But I'll tell you this. If you're not a worshiper, you ain't satisfied because only worshipers are hungry and only hungry people become worshipers. You know, I was thinking, Rev G and I were talking about this the other day because, you know, when I get up in the morning, early in the morning, you know, I'll be in prayer 
it's like God's been showing me like different things that during the, you know, week and we were talking about and, and I said, you know, I, I saw this thing that said, um, like, what's the greatest day that you ever lived? You know, I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know, we, we all can look at different times in our life and think we've had a lot, of, I've had a lot of awesome days and, a, you know, you know, a lot of people say the day my, I got married or the day that my child was born and then you know they say what's the worst day that you ever had in your life or the day I got married and the day I my child was born <laughs> and it's like it uh, turns around <laughs> because um, you know we look at things temporally and and they change all the time and I just started thinking about it the the day the, the greatest day of my life was the most event uneventful it was the most uneventful day but i can remember it i don't remember what happened that day but i remember that i had finished doing the dishes because that was my my system at the time finished the dinner dishes then i'd sit down and read my bible and i remember sitting in the chair reading my bible and asking the lord to come into my life and that i wanted the word of god i wanted they wanted the truth I, and, and let me just say, that was the best day of my life. And I, and I just went to bed, nothing happened, no lightning, nothing. It was a very, very uneventful day. But it was the greatest day of my life. But what led me to that, and I've had some awesome, awesome days since then. But what led me to that was I just had an interest and a hunger for the knowledge of truth, uh, not the Bible. I just wanted to know what was the true meaning of life. <laughs> Very existential. I just want to know what the truth is. I just want to know what is the meaning of I just want to know, you know, I don't want to know anybody's opinion. I want to know what life is and what it's about and what's right and what's wrong and why it's wrong and why it's right. And I just wanted to know. And <clears throat> so by the spirit i was hungry for truth just that much but god took that little hunger for truth and he used it because i was hungry so he was starting to fill me he gave me the knowledge he gave me the knowledge and wisdom to go buy a bible <laughs> and so i bought a bible and then i had a hunger for what was in the Bible, and I just started reading the Bible, and I'm like, this is awesome. How come I never learned this at church? I was raised in church. I, was, I went to Catholic school for eight years, and why, am, why didn't they teach this? Why didn't they teach us about, uh, you know, they talked about the Holy Ghost, but they didn't teach us about the Holy Ghost. And, and I thought, God, whatever's in here, this is what I want. I was 25 years old, and it was like, no big deal. You know, I just went to bed, and I got up, and everything changed. But then I was so hungry for more of the word. I got a taste. I taste and saw that the Lord was good. I wanted more. And then I got the Holy Ghost. And then I wanted more. And then I was like, overkill. <laughs> I just wanted more of God. I just kept wanting more of God. Amen? And that was 47 years ago. I just, or 45, whatever, lose count. I just wanted more of God. And I just continually wanted more. Let me just say, the hunger has waned from time to time during different seasons. I've gotten distracted by things. I've gotten devastated by a test or trial or a tribulation, and I had a God had to help prop me back up on my feet again. But the, then you find yourself, okay, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm still hungry for God. Because once you taste and see, there's nothing else that's going to satisfy. You just need a greater taste. Amen? I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite. Don't you love that? You might have to work up an appetite for the things of God. How do you do that? You, not, you need to think about the things of God and think about the God that fills the universe with his love and grace and mercy and power and beauty everywhere. 
Think about that God. Think about that God living inside of you. We've got to get hungry first and foremost, and we've got to work up an appetite. God is not going to give you an appetite. You've got to work up an appetite. Amen? That's why it says, you seek first the kingdom of God, and then those things will be added to you. Right? There's something we have to do. These things don't happen automatic. Well, if God wanted it, then it would happen. No, that's not true. That is the lie from the pit of hell to believe that, well, if God wants it, then it'll happen. That's not true. That's not how the things of God work. Because God wants all men to be saved and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but they won't. He will not infringe his will on somebody's will. So we have to be hungry. We've got to stir ourselves up. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. We can work up a good appetite for a lot of things in this life, but we have got to, as the children of God, work up a good appetite for him. We got appetite for all, all kind of stuff. Food, hanging around with people, shopping, sports, data, movies, whatever, hobbies, music. We can work up an appetite for a lot of things in this life, but all those things are going to come to nothing and will never satisfy because it's the hunger and the hungry that will be satisfied. So you're blessed. You're blessed. This is, this is when you're blessed. When you've worked up a good appetite for God, he's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. Amen. I said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. See the importance of hunger. We can be complacent and start getting sour thinking that somebody's, it's somebody else's responsibility to make us hungry. You could think, people could start thinking it's the pastor. It's the church. The church I go to is not any good because it, I'm, I'm, I'm not excited about God anymore. Well, the church didn't do that. <laughs> the pastor didn't do that. You allowed it in. <laughs> you got to stir yourself up. The Bible says stir yourself up. The Bible says encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. The, the Bible says right here, work up a good appetite. And you, we have to do that when, when, things, when things grow complacent and cold. We've got to work it up. You say, when I'm more excited about the things of this world than I am of the kingdom of God, Shame on me, I'm going to get myself alone, I'm going to preach to myself because I have got myself in error. Scary thing to become a fan of God and not a worshiper. Hunger is so, so important. In this hour, let me just say, we're going to see in the body of Christ those that are hungry and those that were fair weather fans. The word of God is very clear that there's going to be a great falling away, great falling away, from the faith. And they think it's okay that you can just go anywhere and do anything. And God's okay with it. God's not okay with what you want to do. <laughs> that is such an error in the body of Christ right now where people just think, well, I'm saved and God loves me and I can just do anything and, and, and I can do anything I want. That's not. <laughs> God has a very specific will for each individual. And he wants us to pursue him to find out what that will is. Amen? When people think that they can wave, wag their finger in the face of God because they want to do what they want to do, they're in great danger. Amen? There's going to be times you're going to have to preach to yourself. Amen? I mean, one of the, one of the benefits Guy and I have is that we do preach to each other. <laughs> if we're in the car... It's normally going to get to the subject of God and the things of God and us sharing with each other what God is showing us and getting us conversation and talking about the past and things God has done and God has showed us and where we're going. We'll just talk about the things of God. Amen? But if he ain't in the mood, then I'm going to have to encourage myself. Amen? Hallelujah. Let me read. I'm going to read from Mark. <clears throat> Hallelujah. This is Mark in 12. Mark in chapter 12. 
that's Matthew, Mark, <laughs> and that's chapter 12. I'm just going to turn to it, even though I do have it in my notes, but Mark in chapter 12, and I'm going to start at verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Notice that God had given them a good answer, and he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Hallelujah. You know, there's a lot of talk about sin and what's the worst sin, and everybody wants to talk about, you know, well, I haven't done that. You know, when you're talking to a, a, a sinner or somebody that has not been born again and you talk to them and, about God, they, they want to go, well, I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> what happens to those that have? <laughs> I've only killed five people. <laughs> it really has nothing to do with that. <clears throat> <clears throat> and as Jesus clarified here, he said, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, listen up, world. Listen up, peoples of the nations. <laughs> The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. People think, ah, how do you do that? Get hungry. Get hungry, get hungry, get hungry, and God will fill you, and then you'll get hungrier, and then you get filled, right? Right? Second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself, there is no commandment greater than these. He said the second, aren't you glad he didn't say that was the first? There's a reason that that is second. He said, love the Lord your God with everything within you. That means be a worshiper of God. Put him first, reverence him, his word, his spirit, his will, his plan and purpose, place them above all things in your life. Amen? Reverence him. Because there's absolutely no way ever, ever that you could love your neighbor as yourself or like you should love God without loving God first. He said second do this because first you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with everything within you. You love God. You hunger for him. You're thirsty for him. You're not satisfied with this world or anything of it because you want more of God. So there's whole the whole this walking in love. But we can't, let's not even talk about walking in love because the word of God is very clear that we need to walk in love. But we don't know what that is because the world thinks walking in love, if you tell them, is being nice. Nice is not walking in love. I can't even say that loud enough. Being nice is not walking in love because being nice can't always tell the truth. If you're going to be nice to everybody, I just want to be nice. I want everybody to think I'm nice. Then you cannot walk in love. Because being nice does not tell the truth. Being kind does. You think being nice and kind are the same thing? They're absolutely. Just like being a fan and a worshiper are two, two different things. They seem like, but they're two different things. So is being nice and being kind are two different things. Nice is what people think of you. Kind is what God thinks because you're telling the truth in love. Nice can't tell the truth because somebody will get mad and nice doesn't want anybody mad at them. Nice Nice wants to be loved. Nice wants credit for things. Nice wants people to talk nicely about them. Kind doesn't care. Kind is telling people what God wants you to tell them when they don't want to hear it. Much like me standing at the pulpit. <laughs> I'm kind because I'm saying what God tells me to say. Whether the, whether the hearers want to hear it or not. Whether the hearers want to receive it or not. Why? Because I have a mandate from God to tell the truth. Whether people like it or not. Whether people want to hear it or not. Amen. 
And I'm responsible before God, the creator of the universe, for being kind and telling people the truth. Let me just see. Not every, not every prophecy is nice, but they're all kind. Amen? Not every prophetic word sounds very nice. You have to read some of Brother Hagin's all about the, end, uh, about the last days and the end times. And A.A. A. Allen and all these um, notable prophets of God over the last century. And these prophecies that it came. No, they were not nice. But they were kind. How kind that they said those things by the Spirit of God and had them written down so in 2022 we could read those things. How kind. Even if they fought not wanting to say it. They said it, they wrote it, so we can see those things now. That was kind. Kind is when you say things that people are not going to like you for. And I'm just not saying going around and blabbing and being mean to people. That's what I'm talking. I'm saying speaking by the Spirit of God, that is kind. Amen. So we have to understand, number one, those that are hungry and thirsty, those that are worshipers of God in this hour are going to get filled. And there, there's going to be some kind of some kind of levity that the Spirit of God is going to just fill those persons and, and descend on those people and lift those people up. And, <clears throat> and people around them are going to know there's something different about that person. There's another level of God in that person. They might not understand it, but they're going to say, I want what they've got. Because Jesus said, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Amen. So when we get hungry, though we got to work up a good appetite, when we get hungry, then we get filled. And what do we get filled with? Jesus. We get filled with his love. We get filled with his compassion. We get filled with his power. We get filled with his authority. We get filled with his kindness. We get filled with the fruits of the Spirit. And we get filled with the gifts of the Spirit. Amen? God is not going to let you be filled with the fruit of the Spirit without filling you with the gifts. That's the problem in the church in days gone by. They wanted all the gifts, but nothing to do with the fruit. Amen? The fruit comes when you walk with Jesus. Fruit comes. You get filled with everything. You get filled and the fruit is there, and when that fruit is there, God will give you the gifts, whatever it needs, because he knows that you're not going to go out and try to be nice, that you're going out and you're going to be kind and tell people the truth. It's not nice to tell people that they're going to hell if they don't have Jesus. That's not nice, but it's kind. It's very kind to tell people the truth. Amen? Jesus loves humanity, but he can only reach them through a vessel that's died to itself so it can be filled with him. Amen? We've got to have an understanding that we are not... Let me see. I was telling somebody, I feel like I'm a cheerleader. I was just telling somebody this recently. Yeah, at church when it comes to... I says, I feel like... I'm a cheerleader, <laughs> and I'm, during the week, you know, praying and facing God, and he's given me awesome revelation and prayer and worshiping him and thanking him and just loving on him, and then I turn around to the, to the fans, <laughs> looking for worshipers, <laughs> and I turn around, and I'm like, hey, God, <laughs> the bleachers are empty. <laughs> Did you notice? I've, we've been talking all week about all these awesome revelations and all these wonderful things that you're showing me. And then, and then I turn around to go first and 10 and the fans are doing something else today. <laughs> the fans didn't put this first. <laughs> Amen. Obviously you're here. So, had to, but let me just say, this is cross the board. I'm not just saying just here. This is cross the board at, at churches all over the world where people are satisfied with their dissatisfaction. 
they're happy with being dissatisfied out in the world doing all kind of other things besides putting God first. There's no mistake. There's no mistake. If God's first, he's first. If he ain't, he ain't. <laughs> Something else is. Amen? Now that was kind. <laughs> it might not be nice, but it's kind. Amen? So, so in this, the Lord was showing me that in that hunger, when you start getting filled, it causes you to walk with God. It causes you to walk in the Spirit. What is walking in the Spirit? More aware of the Holy Ghost. And making yourself aware of the Holy Ghost more than anything else. No matter if you go to the grocery store, you're driving in your car, you're amongst people, you know that God is there. Most Christians think that God, they left God at church on Sunday morning and they go out and they got foul mouths and they're doing all kind of things that are not of God. Because if Jesus was standing right there, let me tell you, their mouths would be working differently. And people think they're okay with this stuff. But a little leaven, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Amen. So we've got we've to get hungry so, and God will fill us. And as God fills us, then we've got to be aware. We've got to walk. Let me just say, you, you know what they were just saying, the, the first and greatest commandment is love, right? The first and greatest commandment is love. But we don't understand that love until we hang out with that love. We don't know that love unless we're being intertwined with that love and spending time with the love of God. And when we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and everything that's within us, with all our strength, then we want to be with him. You, you find some young man or some young girl that's just totally smitten and in love with somebody. They just want to be with that person all the time. Well, if you're in love with God, you want to be with him all the time. And so when you get with him and find out how much he loves you, and then you want to be with him more. And it, it, that whole relationship with God and you walk with God, that doesn't mean you don't do things in this world like eat and do laundry and go to the store and go to work and do all these things, but you're doing them with God. And when you do them with God, there's a holiness in it. Amen? That's how you walk in the Spirit. When you, you cannot walk in the Spirit without walking in love. You can't walk in love unless you're walking in the Holy Ghost because otherwise you'll just be nice. And that ain't walking in the spirit. It's not walking in the spirit. Amen. We have to walk in the spirit and we have to walk in love. Right? It's the same thing because when you're in the spirit, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of love. If you're not walking in the spirit, you're walking in something else, but it ain't love. So we've got to get these things straight and walk in love. By walking in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit will cause you to walk in love. Otherwise, you'd just be nice. <laughs> nice stinks. Amen? I'm going to read this scripture in Psalms 25. Psalms 25, verse 14. This is good, huh, Rev G? And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you like it, you say, and if you don't like it, you say, oh, me. <laughs> That's a brother you hate and you say all the time. Say, say amen <laughs> or oh, me. <laughs> Psalms 25, 14. The Lord, love this. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Let me just say the word fear is the same word as worship. Because that word fear is not scared, it's reverence. For those that reverence and worship, those that are worshipers of God, he confides in them. How many of you want God to confide in you? How many of you want to know the secrets of heaven? I tell you, I do. A lot of people think, oh, that's good for old people, but, you know, we're young, we got a lot to live for. You got nothing to live for, but... To live for God. It says the Lord confides. He tells secrets to those who fear him. And he makes his covenant known to them. 
A lot of people are so confused and don't understand the things of God because they're not hungry for God and God's not pouring himself in them. They're not walking in the spirit. They're not walking in love. They're just fair-weathered fans and they're not worshipers of God. <laughs> How's that for a few titles? <laughs> and let me read this out of the, the uh, New Living Translation. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him, or you could say the word fear, or reverence him and worship him. He is a friend to those that reverence him and worship him and he teaches them his covenant that means if you don't become a worshiper it's really hard to learn about the things of god because he doesn't share his secrets and he doesn't teach you these things until you get in that place get in the position of being a worshiper that's hungry for god amen now, this is out of the message. God friendship is for God worshipers. I love it when the word just keeps proving itself out over and over and over. Amen. If you don't get excited about this, you need your, tire, your flat tires changed. You've been running in life with flat tires. We watch these. These high-speed chases, they got all of them in L.A. When there was a high-speed chase, you're like, oh, yeah, it's L.A. The whole country knows high-speed chases only happen in L.A. I don't know why. <laughs> Once in a while, there will be one that will pop up in Georgia. You're like, what the heck? <laughs> oh, the guy's from L.A. <laughs> they think it's okay, I guess. <laughs> Amen. You see these high-speed chases, and all of a sudden, they put that strip out, and one of the tires blows head, and the guy's going on. Three tires and one rim, and sparks are flying. Let me just say, you, you, you can't go very far and very fast on a flat. The, the race is over. <laughs> the chase is done. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you you got to have all four tires in good condition if you're going to be in a race. And we're in a race. It says, God friendship is for God worshipers. Amen? That means God reserves that intimate, close friendship with those that will worship him, those that will put him first, those that will reverence him. Then they begin to walk in the spirit, and they're walking in truth, and they're walking in love automatically. <laughs> Other people tell me, because I've just a stickler for the truth, <laughs> that I'm too honest. I'm like, geez, I, how do you do that? <laughs> Should I throw a little lie in here and there? <laughs> and like, you're too honest. I'm like, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how to mix that up. <laughs> what are you asking for? <laughs> I'm too honest. <laughs> you're like brutally honest. I was like, okay, I don't know. I don't know how to tame it down. I don't know. Add a little lies to the truth. <laughs> nope. It says, God friendship is for God worshipers, those that reverence and walk with him. They are the ones, they, they, they are the ones. This is not for apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Because a lot of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teachers are not walking in this. They're not friends of God's. This is for whosoever. Remember, in the new, everything in the New Testament is for whosoever. Not if you're called to full-time ministry. Whosoever will be a friend of God. Whosoever will worship God. It says, God, friendship is for God worshipers. They are the ones he confides in. How sad is the day a Christian does not care about the secrets of God. How sad is the day when the children of God don't care about what he has to say. Amen? Hallelujah. It's a day of reckoning. It's a day of us making a decision in our hearts to choose this day. Choose this day. This very day, choose this day who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the living God or are you going to serve your flesh? You're going to serve your family. Are you going to serve your job? Are you going to serve your desires? 
your wants or are you going to serve the living God? Because God's got some secrets he wants to tell you. Let me just say, God wants to show you stuff, but you've been looking at the wrong things and in the wrong places. God wants to reveal himself to you, but you're not looking for him. God wants to show you his power, but you're not hungry for it. We got, we got to get real hungry for the things of God. I don't know about you, but I think about, I reflect back in the last 45 years of walking with God and all the mighty, wonderful meetings I've been in and all the times I've had encounters with God, just in my own prayer life and all the awesome things and all of these things that were driven by hunger. They, they were driven by hunger for more of God, hunger to know him more intimately, hungry to please him and not myself, hungry for God. All of these beautiful, wonderful, magnificent things that have happened in my life just because I was hungry for God. But none of them can satisfy now. I want more. And I just, know, knowing that God, in his wisdom, sent us here to Ventura, California to tell people that God loves them and that God wants them and he wants to fill them with power and love, but it comes no other way than to be a worshiper of him. Put him first. I didn't come this far, walking with God for 45 years, I'm 70 now, I didn't come this far to stop. I didn't come this far to quit, I didn't come this far to retire. I am still waiting on the mightiest move of God that this earth has ever seen, and I I am contending for Ventura County. I am contending for the fire of God to fall on me and those that are hungry. And that God knows how to gather those that are hungry and find a place at his feet that he can fill them. Amen? How many of you want to be one of those? Go ahead, raise your hand if you want to be one of those. <laughs> Amen. You want, to, you want God. You want more of God. Amen. Go ahead, raise your hand. That's a sign to God. God, that's me. I want more. I want more of you. I want more of who you are. Lord God, we need you more than we can even think or ask or imagine. We thank you, Father God. that the hungry hearts of this region that will seek your face will find themselves even in this place. And that as we are hungry together, that you will pour out of your spirit unto all flesh, your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and your power. Send the fire, Father, that we will see things that we've only heard of, that we will see things even that we knew not, that your spirit will move in this church and in your church in this region, Lord God. Hallelujah. 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 If we're hungry, then we got to get hungrier. If we're not hungry, we got to we've got to stir ourselves up. We got to nurture a hunger for an outpouring of the move of God like we've never seen before. I don't want to do church without God. Amen. And we've got to make a decision in our heart. How much do we, how much do we want God? Amen. Amen.